this morning before I left the house, um, I, I had a quick rummage on my bookcase and found what I was looking for, which is a tome about this big and that fat, and it's Dr. Ken George's PhD thesis from 1984, okay? <laughs> uh, and, and that is only one half, I believe, of the actual submitted thesis. Um, this, this is, from reading this, I got the impression that Ken actually personally invented the computer in order to do the piece of work he wanted to do in analyzing the script. That's, that's how long uh, uh, Ken has been working on Middle Cornish. Um, so um, I wish I could say, Ken, that I understood everything you were saying in your PhD thesis, but um, I did find it hard going, my beauty. <laughs> um, however, it formed, it has formed an extremely important body of work for all of those as we move forward with our revived language. Could we please welcome Dr. Ken George? And all the all, in order to solve both Oma Rakkausal Aragahui. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to talk about creation of the world. Uh, the last of the mystery plays that we have, and one that I've been working on for about 10 months. The word provenance comes to the fore in the BBC programme Fake or fortune, where we hear a lot about it. This is a program which is introduced by Philip Mould uh, and Fiona Bruce. And I here take the part of Philip Mould. I'm very sorry that I haven't got Fiona Bruce here to help me, <laughs> so I'm sure you'll be as well. Now, here we have the known editions of Creation of the World, this time going forwards from the William Jordan edition of 1611, uh, coming right up to one which I hope to produce shortly. Uh, perhaps the most interesting one here is Paula Noyce because she had really good ideas about where the play came from. Here we have the end of the manuscript by William Jordan where he adds this note here, endeth the creation of the world with noise flood. So did they separate these two elements? Apparently he did. Written, but not as we shall see, composed by William Jordan. And the actual date given the 12th of August 1611, a date which has been made clear is a long time after the Reformation. Well, did he compose it? No, I don't think he did. And I'm not the only one to suggest this. Jenna wrote he may have been merely the transcriber. Paula Noyce, since the manuscript is a fair copy, William Jordan was probably only the scribe. And uh, Nicholas Williams, he was clearly copying from an earlier <laughs> exemplar. And we shall see that that is indeed the case. But if he was not the composer, then we have to disentangle his work from that of the composer. His text is not the original, it is different from the original, as we shall see. Now one of the interesting things about creation of the world is that part of it, not very much, 7% of the text is borrowed from Origo Mundi. So let's look at that. Here are the scenes in Creation of the World and in Origo Mundi in the left-hand column. And where they come from, they not all, doesn't all come from Genesis. Some of it is extra-biblical. The story of Lamech and Cain, for example, which occurs in Creation but not in Origo Mundi, comes from the Talmud, and so on. So we see here that the fall of Lucifer, Lamech and Cain, the translation of Enoch, and the making of the pillars do not occur in Origo Mundi. And when we see the number of lines which actually are transferred, they're very different. We also notice that the fall of Adam and Eve, which is treated in both plays, 
is more than double the length in creation than it is in Oliver Mundy. Creation is, the, the author of creation is expanding the story considerably, or certain parts of it. Uh, Adam and Seth, as well, is significantly longer, 50% longer in creation. But Noah's flood is about the same length. Onigo Mundi, of course, goes on to, uh, with a lot of other material from, from later in the Old Testament, so that the portion covering the actual creation and Noah's flood in Origo Mundi is squeezed, it's much shorter. Creation is longer. The Breton play which covers these events is, is even longer, it's two days. Now when we see, when we look at the uh, scenes in w which are common to both, I've outlined them here in, in yellow, now the creation of Adam and Eve and the fall, Cain and Abel and Noah's flood. In those four scenes there are significant borrowings from Origo Mundi and they concentrate on the part of God, God the Father. However, there are, there are plenty of lines uh, in the first five days of creation spoken by God. God is, speaks nearly all those lines in both plays. And yet, there's only one line which is common to both. So the concentration here is on certain episodes in these scenes where the borrowing takes place. And here they are at the bottom. In the creation of Adam and Eve, the concentration is when God is inviting Adam to name the creatures. In the Breton play, by the way, Adam names 52 different birds, which is really remarkable for those who are interested in getting birds' names. We probably have to pinch the Breton names there. Uh, where God, in the fall, God confronts Adam after the eating of the apple, Cain and Abel where he confronts Cain after the murder of Abel, and in Noah's flood when he warns Noah of the flood to come. These are particularly interesting and uh, dramatic parts of the action. And it's Paula Noyce who points out that of the 180 lines roughly imported, 132 are among the speeches of God, and the remaining ones are those which are just before God's speeches or just after. So that she suggests that it was an actor who had played God who had remembered these sections which he, he had played and imported these into creation of the world. And Ben Brook agrees with this and so do I. It's fairly obvious. Now if we compare chunks of text for, between Origo Mundi and creation of the world, we see that there are a number of differences. There are orthographic differences. For example, here the word tear, uh, pretty we can't use the pointer on this. Tear here in Origo Mundi is T-Y-R. In uh, creation it's, it's acquired an extra E, reminding us it's a long vowel, tear and more has acquired an E in the middle and Ascor uh, an E and Luz an E. So these are purely orthographical changes as far as we know the pronunciation was pretty much the same. There are phonological changes for example uh, Kemer here Kimar I'll come back to that later there are textual changes. He didn't remember this line properly. In Bisma Raktri Askor, he couldn't remember Bisma, so he just stuck in a filler word, certain. And there are also grammatical changes. For example, Warneze, Warneze was replaced by Warnothens. The reason for that I'll come to later. And uh, my fee, 
here, the, the second singular sub present subjunctive, had been lost. But the third subjunctive, my foe, was still going. But it, it acquired here a second person singular ending. So instead of my fee, he's got my fota. But then he has to leave out biz in order to have the, the same number of syllables. So there are changes like that. Are they due to Jordan or are they due to the composer? We don't know. We don't know all of them, but we do know some, as we shall see. Now, another trick which uh, the composer did was to add certain lines to the text from Origo Mundi. Here, for example, we have God addressing Adam. Here we have a, a verse in Origo Mundi. And in Creation of the World, two extra lines have been added in Telerma and Prag Arista in Dalla. Why, did they, why was this done? Well, it's to expand the story. If we actually look at this, you have the Cornish on the left here. If we look at the next two lines, we find that it's made to extend the story. God asks here in creation, but not in Origo, why did you do so? Why did you eat the fruit? And Adam immediately blames Eve here. So the composer of creation here is expanding the story, and we find this all the way through, especially in this, in this scene, the fall of Adam and Eve. Now, interestingly, we find the same pattern elsewhere in the play. That is to say, in the 93%, which is not borrowed from Origo Mundi. Here, for example, we have a section where the lines, the pattern is exactly the same, and the apparently added lines are not necessary for the action. So this made, this made people like, like uh, Keith Bailey, for example, think that maybe this section was taken in the same way as from Origamundi from another play, a missing play, a missing play which was of the same date as Aragomundi. Let's see whether that might be the case. So this, this was the idea proposed more or less independently by, by Paul, I've got Pamela there, Paula Noyce and Keith Bailey, that there was a lost play of the same date as Aragomundi, maybe 1425 or thereabouts. And this, the lost play was imported, and this was combined by some unknown author at some unknown date, and it was subsequently copied by Jordan in 1611. Is this the case? Well, let us now look at the possible date of composition of this play. And in order to help us with this, we need to look at a phonological change which occurred in Cornish, the vocalic mergers. And here we have a table showing these mergers. Here we have the word i pronounced in uh, Middle Cornish as inne, in them, and this became inna, the newer spelling, and the, the, the central date of this change is about 1485. So there was no difference between in them and the word inna, meaning narrower. And likewise, in no, in him, also became inna. 
So that also was indistinguishable from the word for narrower, but it was also indistinguishable for the word for in them. So that was a bit of a problem. If you have in them and in him with the same pronunciation, ina, you have to do something. And what was done was to pick the uh, third person endings for in them and substitute them. So instead of ina for that, we had inans. That's where you got the war northerns from, which I pointed out on an earlier slide. The same thing happened with when these vowels, e and o, were followed by a consonant. So gueles to see became guelas and was then confused with guelas, meaning saw. These changes occurred later than this change, and I date these as about 1525. Similarly, gortos to wait became Gortas and was thereby confused with Gortas, the, the third preterite, weighted. These mergers are very important because if we study the rhyming schemes in the plays, we can tell which of these two systems were used. Was it the earlier system, which applied to the ordinalia, or was it the system where these mergers had taken place? I might add that these changes didn't suddenly occur on these dates. They probably took about 200 years to work themselves out. Now, we can see here that here's another verse taken from Mundi, with the same one here in uh, creation. And here we have e, e, trinite, huare. These are more or less, huare is certainly stressed, trinite also is stressed to some extent, and so we don't get a change here, tas hamap in trinite and huare, but biue, to live, arte, also, these changed. Bue to bua, arte, arta. So the rhyming scheme changed. Here, this rhyming scheme is, is alternating. It's a, it's a stanza of eight alternating A, B, A, B, A, B. But here we have A, B, A, B, but here we have A, C, A, C. So the original rhyme schemes no longer work. It's, you can still use it, you can still play it, you can still speak it, it works. It, but the rhyme scheme is different. Now, if we look at this verse, which is not taken from Argo Mundi, we see that we have a, a, and a, which suggests it was written at least after the mergers. Whether it was composed after the mergers, probably was. And the same here. These, before the mergers, at the date of the ordinalia, we would have had here, for example, zotho, to him, ragtho, for him, and goese, friends. O, O, and A would not rhyme. But in creation of the world, they do rhyme. They all rhyme as R. So we can deduce from that that this verse, at least, was composed after the date of the mergers. Here's, an, here's a, a, a perhaps more convincing example. The word for low in Ordinalia's time, Izel, became Izal. And here it's rhyming with a stressed word, fal. So this is a real rhyme, izal and fal. And here we have hezes going to hezas, rhyming with bras, big. So we do find unstressed words 
which had changed according to the merger, rhyming with stressed words. And there are 25 examples of this type throughout creation of the world. And similarly, the cases where you have a vowel ending the word, we find that rhyming with stressed words. Semptie, to tempt, becomes semptia, and it rhymes with the stressed word tra. Nevre, never, becomes nevra, uh, that rhymes with krupya, that's a rhyme, but we, this is the one I'm concentrating on. Well, there are 79 examples of this type in the play. So I conclude from that that the, the play was composed after the date of the mergers. That is to say, after 1525. The next thing I want to look at is the, the analysis of stanzaic forms. Oliver did mention, talk about this briefly. Uh, in all the miracle plays before creation, almost all of the stanzas have one of three basic patterns. This was recognized by myself and Ben Brook. And my codes for these are S6, which is AABCCB, S8, ABABCDDC, and A8, which is alternating AB. And since I've written quite a lot of Cornish poetry, I can tell you that the A, A, B, C, C, B are the easiest to compose, and these are the most difficult. There are many very variants of these patterns. Uh, A4 is one I want to mention, because that's half of A8. For example, I could give you examples of each. Here is uh, an S6 pattern, A, A, B, C, C, B. Faso to Olgo. Another rhymes with Zimmo. That's interesting. It doesn't look as if it rhymes because the, the spelling is different. And the reason for that, uh, going a little bit ahead of myself, is that Jordan still spoke Zimmo as Zimmo, whereas the composer said it uh, as, pronounced it as Zimma to rhyme with another. So Jordan was messing about. Here we have a, a more complicated pattern. This one is not found in Oligomundi, but it is found in Bunis Marezic Bunis K, and that is A B A B C D D C, and the syllable count is usually four sevens followed by a short line four, and then three heptasyllabic lines, and A eight, which is simple, but the most difficult to write. Uh, for example, in the Passion Poem, almost every stanza is A8. I, I have had a go at writing a, a poem that's similarly. It's difficult. It's difficult because you have to find four rhymes of A and four rhymes of B. The first ten stanzas in Oregomundi are A8. It obviously had a great prestige, but it's not found in Bunin's K. So those are the three patterns. And if we look at the way in which they are distributed in Oregomundi, not the whole of the play, but just the play that corresponds to creation of the world, then the A8 are in dark green and the S6 are in light green. The whole of that are covered by just two basic patterns. But if you compare that with creation of the world, those two patterns, A8 and S6, very, very different. We find the, those orange parts here, marked by orange bars, one, two, three, four, are the principal borrowings of, from Oregomundi. And even those do not show continuous A8 and S6. The, 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 the stanzaic patterns are not the same as the play that they are borrowing from. And apart from little bits, for example, here, in the, the last bit of the uh, five days of creation, 
And this bit here, which, which is the uh, leading up to the murder of, of uh, Abel by Cain, apart from that, <laughs> there's not a lot of A8 or A6. It's nearly all white. It's something else. Well, what else is there? What other patterns are there? Well, the first one is to add, it, to add in is S8, which doesn't occur in the Ordinalia. So I've indicated that. I've colored that green as well, but I've indicated those by red crosses. So that's starting to fill up the pattern a bit. Now, there are extended stanzas in other plays. These are the developments of the stanzaic patterns which Oliver referred to. For example, in Bunus Mariasek, the AABCCB has a coda CB, and likewise the S8 has a coda here. Or you can have AABCCB, an ordinary S6, and you can go and uh, add another three lines, DDB. That's quite common. Or you can add this pattern, repeat the CDEC with EFFE. -E. That's done. And so on. There are not a great number of these extended stanzas in the other plays, but they do exist. Now, if we add the, the extended stanzas to creation of the world, these are the uh, stanzas with red dots. So we're beginning to fill it up, but there's still a lot of white space left. Now the next classification are degenerate stanzas, and these come about because of the mergers. Because all the e eh rhymes have gone to a, ah, and all the o oh rhymes have gone to a, ah, then the pool of different rhymes is, is, has been changed. And we find creation of the world is, is picking out an awful lot of rhymes with R. So a normal S8, A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C, might become degenerate. A, B, A, B, B, C, C, B. They're using the same B rhyme as they are here. Or even A, B, A, B, A, 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 A. These are called degenerate. And I'm using degenerate here in a secondary sense, but a genuine one, lacking some usual or expected property or quality. It doesn't mean that they are, they are inferior. It just means they uh, are not fully formed. So if we include the degenerate standards, which I've marked by uh, magenta bars here, some here, then... I think that's as far as we're going to get with a conventional stanzaic analysis of creation of the world. We still have an awful lot of white left. No, I think we can go, bit, I think we can go one step further. Yeah, there are two new patterns in creation of the world, which you scarcely find at all in the other plays. And they are A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C, which I've called S, X. X standing for 10, this is a 10 line stanza, and R8, R stands for reversed, it's, it's an S8 stanza reversed. So those are essentially new to creation of the world, so we can add those in. Ah, there we are, I've added them in, and I've colored the white yellow now, so the yellow ones are still unclassified. I cannot I, I cannot analyze them using a conventional stanzaic analysis. So that is the picture of the stanza patterns in creation of the world. It's really kaleidoscopic. And I will compare it with those of the other plays. That's coming back to Aragamundi. This is the first day of Buna's Mariazek, which is pretty largely green, as you can see, conventional. There are one or two uh, th here, uh, extra lines. There, there occasionally, there's a, there's a yellow one which is uh, unclassifiable, but on the whole it looks very different from creation. And here is day one of Bunin's K, which is nearly all green. Uh, there are some differences. 
And here, the, the white section is the bit that the poor scribe had a problem with because four pages were, were, were cut out. So the point I'm making here, as you can see, is creation in terms of stanzaic patterns is very different from the previous play. It's not the only thing that's different. Here, if we compare the features of the stanzas, we find that in creation, SX stanzas are common, R8 stanzas are common. In the other plays, they're, they're either rare, very rare, or absent. Likewise, degeneracy and unclassified are rare, very rare, or absent in the other plays. So these features are distinctive to creation. Other things are common, S6 and S8 are common and so on. Uh, A8 are quite rare in, A, in creation, but they're very common in Aurigavundi. Right, the next thing I want to turn to is the way that these texts are actually laid out on the page. If we look at the layout, for example, of an A8 stanza, this is the same one, this is one that's borrowed from Aurigamundi, you can see that the way they're laid out is like this, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. And between the two lines, there, there's a, a marker, which I've classified as a dot here in uh, Aurigamundi, but in creation, it's more like a, a line. Uh, a diagonal line. But what's more interesting than that is in Origo Mundi and all the other plays apart from creation the lines are linked by brackets on the right. So you can see where the stanzas are and what constitutes a stanza. Whereas in creation it's quite different. It has a vertical line here and a horizontal line to split this stanza from the next. The S6 stanzas look like this in Origomundi. Again, they are using here these brackets to connect them. So we have to read this. A, A, B, C, C, B, in that order. Whereas in uh, creation, this is the way that this particular, the same, the same S6 stanza is laid out. Here is the manuscript, this is Jordan's manuscript, and I have written it out here because it's not that easy to read. It takes uh, some practice to read the manuscript, obviously. And you can see that we have A, A, B, C, C, B like that. The other interesting thing here, about, by the way, is that this is a speech by God the Father, here we have Father, and underneath Father, which I haven't been able to reproduce here, is a hand, maybe a gloved hand, and this is a sign that this is taken from a copy of the play in which God the Father was being played. He, he's marked by using a hand like this, all the speeches by the father, so he can pick them out on the, in the text. Now, in the S8 stanzas, in creation, there are two columns. This is A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C. We have the A, B, A, B here, C there, then the D, D there, and C there. So there are two distinct columns. The left-hand column, uh, and the right-hand column. The right-hand column are called tail rhymes. And here is a summary, then, of the different ways in which these are laid out. A8 is pretty similar, except you've got this here. Uh, S6 has brackets, whereas creation has two columns. And again, S8, differently in the ordinalia, and Bunes K. Bunes Merazic is different because the size of the paper is, is narrower, so they, they have to squeeze the, the text in more. 
but creation again has two columns. So here we have brackets for the other plays, two columns for creation of the world. Why? Well, I would suggest it's because the author of creation of the world never saw the text of the other plays. He did not know how they were conventionally laid out. And that suggests to me that creation of the world was composed after the closure of Glasny in, well, 1548, we've seen. Um, I think it was. I don't think it was linked to Glasny. Glasny had been dissolved by the time that creation was composed. Right, if we can't get anywhere with stanzas in creation of the world, we have to set up a completely different structure to, in order to understand how it was composed, how it was laid out, the, the, the way that the verses were made up. And we get a clue about this by looking at the way that it is laid out on the page. It's not laid out, as in the other plays, as we've seen. It is laid out in chunks which Ben Brook calls segments. Quite a good word. The rhymes in the left column are called body rhymes and the rhymes in the right column are called tail rhymes. If we analyse the layout, the text, using segments, it is more successful than using stanzas. Using stanzas, as we could see, we only really got about 70% of the text analyzable. So let's look at segments. There are three distinct types. There are portions, if you like, of the stanzas. A, B, A, A, B, and A, B, A, B, C. And when you combine these, you, you form the stanzas. I'm sorry if it looks a bit like algebra, but really, <laughs> that's what it is. This is the way that the composer of creation of the world thought in, he, in his head. He, he had the rhythm of the Cornish plays in his head, but he did not have the stanzaic structure in his head in the same way. He thought he, he was working on smaller units. Instead of the total stanza, he was working on subsections of the stanzas, which we're calling segments. And you could combine the segments. He combined them in, in any way he pleased. For example, A, B, A, B is one segment, that's A4, that's simple. You combine two of them, you get A8. You combine two A, A, Bs and you get S6. You combine A, B, A, B, C and D, D, C, you get S8, that's fine. But you can also combine A, A, B and this one. I have to label it differently because there are di different rhymes. That will give you R8, the reverse of S8. A, stanza which barely occurs at all in the other plays, but it's quite common in creation of the world. And likewise, SX is two of these. And even the more complicated uh, stanzas can be explained by segmental analysis. Now I want to show you the beginning of the play, because th this is very important, really. When you look at the beginning of the play, and I've got about 35 lines here of the beginning of creation. What immediately stri strikes you is that this bit, A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C, is an S8 stanza. Omma, Avir, and Clodis, War, Fas, and Dor, Incertum, and so on. This could be the start of the play, but it's not. He starts in Latin. Ego sum alpha et omega. Why he puts the ego in, I don't know, because uh, it, it's too many syllables. He, he could get away with sum alpha et omega. But the third line here, peer rear me you. Uh, I, I am alpha and omega without beginning or end. Peer rear me you. For sure I am. That is a total line of padding. <laughs> I, why is it there? Why is it there as the third line of this play? And the answer is because it is a tail rhyme which rhymes with virtue here, with deo here, and with eu here. So what he's doing here is constructing a chain of tail rhymes which 
come down here, and they were indicated here, I have in indicated them by brackets. The brackets are not in the text, they're my brackets to, to emphasise the tail rhymes. Then he gets down to here, then he runs out of inspiration with tail rhymes there, so <laughs> he, he changes the tail rhyme. Instead of eu, he goes to a, my fohenna. A, magata, nevra, and komandia. So he goes from one chain of tail rhymes to the next chain of tail rhymes. This is totally different from the uh, beginning of Origomundi. The beginning of Origomundi is stately A8 stanzas, and Taz and Nave and Gilwear, and so on, on and on and on. About how many? Seven, seven or eight A8 stanzas, one after the other. That was high class poetry in Origo Mundi, in the Ordinaria. This is the best poetry which the composer can produce. This is his new standard. It's a different style completely. So, if we look at these chains of tail rhymes, here they are, eu, virtue, deo, eu, and then going on here to produce 36 lines of continuous poetry. And here, later in the play, th this is uh, from Adam Seth, which also occurs in, in Origo Mundi, but, but quite differently. There are no borrowings of God's speeches from, uh, or hardly any, from Adam Haseth. And here we have Death, Vith going on, chains of rhymes, so that we have a whole mega stanza, if you like, uh, of 31 or so rhyme lines, and here are 36. This is the gold standard of comp composition in creation of the world. And just to show you the differences here, this is quite interesting. Here on the left, we have an extended S6 stanza, AAB. CCB, and it's extended with three more lines, DDB. Compare that with this bit. AAB, CCB, but he can't think of another rhyme to go with the B. So he changes the tail rhymes and goes to E, and then adds BBD to rhyme with that. This has just one more line, but the structure is more complicated, much more complicated than that. It's a different structure. We can analyse the structures. There, there are four types when we look at the, uh, at the segmental structure. We have alternating, which is, produces alternating standards A8 and indeed A4. There are no tail rhymes, there are no link rhymes, it's just one segment. Two brackets, will produce two tail rhymes, no link rhymes, and these account for these stanzas. But in the others here, we are not in stanzaic territory at all. But they are analysable. Multi-tail rhymes, three or more segments, three or more tail rhymes, and, also, and finally, the most elaborate of all, which I call catenary, because there are chains here of segments, chains of uh, tail rhymes, two or more segments, two or more tail rhymes, one or more link rhymes. If we now analyse creation in this way, you get a very different picture. The whole of it is analysable and classifiable under this new structure. Right, well that brings us to Jordan's part in all this. I've made it quite clear that I don't think Jordan wrote this, he just copied it. And here we can see, for example, he made mistakes. Here he had a line which he crosses out. To show you this, uh, typed out, he was copying from an exemplar. He writes the line, all guns or tail entry. And here he writes it again and realizes, oh, I made a mistake. I must cross it out. Because it's, it's different page, he's copying it onto a different page. 
So that, to my mind, pre uh, is evidence that he's copying. But much more important, there are about 45 cases where he does not respect the rhyme of the composer. That is to say, he was writing the, rewriting the text according to the way that he spoke, and he didn't speak Cornish in the same way as the composer. For example, there's a, a rhyme of Omar and Kala. I've got Kala with a star, because that's not what was written, but that was what the composer wrote. Kala, I, I can, if I can, actually. I, Jordan actually wrote Kalaf, which is older. That's interesting because he's actually using an archaism here. Uh, similarly, he didn't like reducing O to A in his speech. So where Omma rhymes with Dovda, a very late rhyme, he writes Vodho, and so on. Very interesting one here. Uh, Adam and Cam rhyme if there's no pre-occlusion. But in Jordan's time, there was pre-occlusion. So some of Jordan's speech was archaic and some of Jordan's speech was new. That it, he used pre-occlusion. So Jordan, you can dis disentangle some of the uh, modifications which Jordan had made. So, if it wasn't composed in 1611, when was it composed? Well, the mergers suggest it was composed after about 1525. The layout suggests it was composed after 1549. And I, I believe it was composed in the reign of Queen Mary. That is the same time as Tregear's homilies, because the, the, that was a time, obviously, when the country was under Catholic rule, and it would have been much easier, one minute, to uh, write and produce a play at that time. So creation is different in many ways. Here are the ways in which it is different. This is the proposed provenance, the 7% transmitted orally, 93% composed later, about 1555, copied by Jordan. The conclusions? Well, Noyce's conclusion, an actor brought 180 lines to creation. I think it's like that it was the same actor who composed the rest of it. He was unaware of the traditional way of formatting verse. His knowledge was oral. He composed the play in about 1555. Jordan copied it in 1611, including his own changes. Right, well, there are Raz the Keith Bailey, because it was he who inspired me to study this play in the first place, and Ben Brook, who gave me a copy of his doctoral thesis. That, al that also takes a lot of going through. <laughs> and thank you to you, Maraz to we all. Oh, God's Louisi, Maraz. Thank you so much for taking us through that so logically and systematically. Um, I don't know w the fact that I'm fascinated by that, whether that makes me a degenerate as well, um, but that level of diving into these manuscripts, I just find it absolutely fascinating. Now, we have got half an hour when we're allowed to have a bit of Q&A. As neutral, unbiased chair, I'm allowed to ask the first question. <laughs> And there's, I've got a little thing here, which was just, there was a little tantalising thing dropped in. Um, missing play. Oh, and oh, my dear life. Now then. We've got, you can call it four, four manuscripts, six plays, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, six plays. Yeah. <laughs> We've got two saints plays that are very specific to specific parishes. We've got an ordinalia that we, is related to the creation later, and there's a suggestion that that ordinalia could have been performed in more than one place, but that probably the saints... I mean, some people have said that the, that the structure of them means that you could take bits out, put bits back in, and make it, you know, you know what they'd like in Redruth, put your own local bit in. Um, 
But is that the case? Are we talking about a 5% survival of the material that once existed? What is the missing corpus of Middle Cornish drama? Michelle. Okay, well, in addition to the 5% of written and visual that might have existed, you've also got to account for the oral, which is a really big part of it. I think also while Ken was talking, I, I, was, I was thinking two things came into my mind. One was, I think I said that um, Passion Agonalith, that there's some suggestion there, um, comparing it with the um, Ordinalia, that that may reflect an earlier core there. I just wonder whether there's any mileage, um, Ken, with your, your missing element of actually comparing a little bit of Passion Agonalith and the Ordinalia and seeing if it, if it in any way fills um, your, your stanza gaps in terms of structuring. I don't know, it might, may or may not be worth a, a, a punt. But I think there, there is a missing something, but there's also a big all tranche there. And to what extent you've got any backstory of interludes, smaller mm -hmm. interludes. And the other thing that came to mind is when Ken showed the, you know that first line, Ken, that threw things out? Ego sum alpha et omega. Now, if you left ego out, which, okay, you could do grammatically, that would be like saying the great am as opposed to the great I am. And it was so well known as, as a scriptural quote from Ezekiel and Revelation that you kind of couldn't do it. And it reminded me, if you know the Holcomb Bible that I showed you from the 1320s, um, the way that text is composed there, the images are new creations, okay? They quote earlier sources, but it's new creation visually. The text there is made up to caption the illustrations, the visualization, and it's a mixture of Latin phrases, it's a mixture of Anglo-Norman French, so you've got the th stuff you hear in church, the stuff you want to do if you're in polite society, and then it's got the stuff in Middle English that you yell at the kids out of the solar window. And it's a, so a total sort of mish, it's a, it's a mash-up, yeah? Um, and so I'm pretty sure that those sort of poor man Bibles kind of caught on quite quickly. And the visuals and the quotes in Passion Agonalith, which isn't high art, is kind of like a, a, a local shorthand iteration of a poor man's Bible. So some of those episodes, I think, again, could have been visualised and available in visual material with this mixed linguistic mm -hmm. orality coming together. And so there could have been other things like that that would also Thank have you. supplemented the oral backstory. And, and, and we know that through the Reformation, we lost an extraordinary quantity of visual. Uh, and it's great that you've captured uh, some of that in your new book. I want, I, want, I want to ask essentially the same question to Oliver. Um, William Howes famously said that every scarce any parish was without a plan of quarry. And you yourself, I think, uh, uncovered about 30-odd um, and then that was built on by Rodrigo. So it turned out, yes, almost every parish had a plan of quarry. Did every parish have its own saints play? Ooh, pretty unlikely. I think it takes a lot of work to produce one of those plays. What I was thinking as Ken was speaking was it needn't actually be another missing play, but more an intermediate version of Origo Mundi that did have the Fall of the Angels, because Fall of the Angels essentially belongs in the Origo Mundi story. And I think there are hints in the... Um, uh, manuscript of the Ordinalia that it did have the two things that are obviously missing from the story. Um, one is the fall of the angels and the other is the childhood of Christ. The Passion play launches straight into the adult Christ's ministry and most um, uh, stories would have the childhood of Christ as well. And I think there are hints of both of those in the Origo, uh, in, in the Ordinalia manuscript. So uh, we could postulate a an intermediate version of Origo Mundi that might have had the fall of the angels. And perhaps uh, took four missing. days? Mm? Five days? <laughs> well, Six uh, days? Or after they'd cut it down to not be the whole biblical story, but yeah. perhaps just the Old Testament. And we know from Infancia Salvatoris, okay, in English, but we know that there were infancy plays. And that is biggie, a biggie, you know, everybody mm. loves that. And Holcomb's um, very, very big on that. And Ken, it also interested me that the, um, the passages that you said you know, aren't so, so represented like um, Cain and Lamech and Adam and Seth, etc. Those are passages, and the Adam and Eve section, those are passages that are given a big visual trope with captioning in the Holcomb Bible. Okay, missing plays. Yes. Uh, well, I don't think there was a missing play 
for creation of the world itself. That is to say, I don't think that creation of the world was actually taken from a play, but uh, the, the story may have been taken from a missing play. And as you just said, Oliver, there may have been uh, uh, something which included uh, maybe uh, Lamech and Cain. The stories were known, so, but for the actual taking into creation, no. However, uh, on the first folio of creation, it does say first day of the play, which implies that there may have been a second one. It may never have been written, or it may have been written and lost. Uh, so there's a possibility there. Um, the plays seem to find their way to Wales, but I wonder whether other missing plays may have found their way to the Vatican. Mm -hmm. So, um, in my role as neutral chair, I'm allowed to say that I reckon absolutely there were more sense plays. Uh, it seems unlikely to me that we would have got the only two that there were, uh, and I don't suppose that all, uh, is it 258 parishes in Cornwall had their own, or even those in the western half of Cornwall. But I reckon that we know that pre-Reformation celebrations were participative, colourful, and locally rooted as well as having transnational components and so um, I, I, I loved our, our comment from Meredith about discovering that treasure and I live in hope that, that either in the Vatican or maybe in a dusty drawer in Brittany somewhere there might yet be another missing play. Or maybe in a national trust property in Cornwall, who knows? <laughs> you never know. So that was my question. Um, I have, I have one little question from the floor, but I wonder if there's somebody else who would like uh, to... Yeah, Sue Hill. And I'm going to repeat your question, Sue, so that we make sure we captured it. OK, well, it's, it's, so a, it's a couple of observations and a question. Go for it, and I'll do a little summary so, back. Sue Hill, theatre maker, Wild Works, knee high. Um, I, I'm an actor, amongst other things, but I was very taken with the, the actor's experience that's kind of describing what you're saying. The... Um, the notation of the hand on the scripts. We do that. We underline with highlighter where our bits are so we can scan the script. And that, that very immediate sense of this is an actor's text. Um, and, but also the, 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 the stanza, the Alpha and Omega stanza, and uh, him inserting, um, uh, for sure I am. It's, it's of course I am. It's, it's a, that's an actor's instinct just to, to emphasize the. the uh, I'm, I'm introducing myself and I'm powerful. Of course I am. <laughs> um, the question is about how these plays, what these texts are for. The, the implication is that the text is for an actor to, to learn. Is that, but, but we, we think that the, the performers were guild members. They wouldn't necessarily have been literate. So how were the, were the texts as, were they copies for actors? Were they copies for posterity in archive, or were um, and and but how would actors have learnt them? Would um, I'm, I'm guessing that not everyone in in uh, uh, these pieces would have been able to read. So how would they have been learned? So it, um, I need to just quickly attempt to summarise. Thank you, Sue. Um, the manuscripts we have upstairs were they a working copy for the ordinary, a working copy for the actor to learn? If they weren't for the actor, how did the actor? learn their parts. Michelle? Um, well, first of all, they're not all the same thing. No. Um, I think whatever lies behind the ordinalia is likely to be the ordinary's copy. Mm. Yeah, so it's a director's copy. Um, I think to understand sort of medieval literacy, you have to understand that it's not an awful lot to do with the ability of reading and writing. If you have a look at Mary Carruthers' Book of Memory, for example, it will show you some of the strategies that you had to um, develop to have that degree of, of mnemonic capacity, which today we find actors are, are one of the, the best proponents of that still today. And of course, verse forms, etc., help you in that mnemonic and have since, since very ancient times. Um, in a mercantile environment, in the tra towns, etc., 
access to literacy, as we understand it, wasn't just a, ca a case of um, your place in society. If you were a duke's son or daughter, and all you're concerned about is hunting, shooting, fishing and warfare, you're not going to be terribly literate as we know it. Yeah. If you're a merchant's daughter, you're going to know uh, as much about literacy and numeracy as you need to turn a buck. Okay. So again, don't, don't think it's all elitist in character, it's mixed. Um, but the ability to, to learn, like if you were composing your PhD yeah, in Oxford University in the 13th, 14th century, you compose it mentally here, for delivery here, in a theatre of about 200 of your peers and professors. And that's a big amount of text to compose and remember and recite orally. So it's not as strange to them. Now, obviously, people... I don't think we've got formal guilds in Cornwall, but if you've got trade associations and groupings, a bit more like Midsummer Night's Dream mm -hmm. and Bottom and Co., yeah? Um, th their, their experience of, of how you learn some of this stuff is going to have more to do with the sort of pop songs that you sing in the pub, um, which are popular iterations of stuff you've heard in the pulpit or at the wayside cross. So it's complex interaction. But one thing's for sure, medieval memories are a darn sight more attuned and um, less lazy than ours. Thank you. Um, Oliver, would you like to add something about what the manuscripts are for? Well, I've wondered that very much too. And especially the Ordinalia one is such a beautiful thing and also so well preserved. It doesn't look as if it's seen a lot of use itself. Well, it hasn't seen rehearsals. Yeah, quite, yes. But it's a late but, copy. But li like you, I think I, I yeah. wondered whether there would be a, as it were, producer um, who would have it and then he would um, teach the actors orally from that yeah. uh, master part. The ordinary. Um, I don't know how actors work in, um, in subsequent times, Shakespeare's time and in modern times. Do they have the whole text or do they have their part with the preceding and following speeches, because... You tend to have the whole text, mm -hmm. and then you do go through and mark your part. So when but you're scanning, you're, especially at the early stages of rehearsal, you have the text with you, you don't learn it straight away. And so you're, you're wanting to identify your place on the page, so yes. you do mark it. Yeah. With, the, with our contemporary version of the, yeah. of the little drawn hand. Just to say, the, the little drawn hand is what we call a maniculum, and it means the pointing hand. And they, they become very popular in academic circles in the 14th century onwards mm -hmm. so it is your your magic marker yeah, equivalent yeah. but it's not peculiar to actors it's yeah. something that comes from the the sort of scholarly forum so of course uh, michelle did mention the charter fragment which is this bawdy mm. poetic piece and uh, of course one one school of thought and if you look at that charter you can see the fold lines and actually for me it makes entire sense that this is a player's part you're not hearing the other person's voice. Yeah. You're, how much time and energy to write out one of those manuscripts? Yeah, yeah. It's going to take... Old William Jordan was at it for a fair yeah. old while. So you're not going to write the whole thing out. Jason, I've just been through the whole ordinary and lifted out a few certain lines that you might be thinking about. <laughs> because it's even in the days of computerators, it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. By the time you get into the copy of uh, Boonan's K, both... The main writing and these additional bits of stage direction are in the same hand. Whereas in the ordinaria, there is a, clearly a separate hand that says, get the altar ready and God has to stand by. It's a separate hand, which implies, the ha to me, implies the hand of the, the ordinary, the producer. I uh, can just say, these are later copies. Yeah. Again, yeah? yeah. So again, the materiality of the copies no, we've got that. isn't so the materiality of the. First. And can I just add the other thing we we know we've lost for sure. I've done a lot of work on these. Is if you're writing on notepad, etc., on your phone, etc., is um, the missing notepad of its day is wax tablets, yeah. And that's what you would write your your quotes for and your parts, and they're reusable, yeah. etc. And we've even got little 14th century filofaxes from. Um, from York, from brothel yeah. backyards, etc., of, of the sort of things that people would, would write, you know, passages from um, vernacular texts, obviously, that they were learning. So to, 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 to take that to Ken, um, I, I, I think we all find it really attractive, the idea that some old codger who had played God 40 years ago is now remembering the lines, uh, and that's a lovely scene, is it plausible, though, that it wasn't a human being 
Is it plausible that what they had was a player's part and that it was the gold bit that they were then transcribing into uh, Greens and Peas? It's plausible, but uh, I, I think it's more likely that, that this was done, done orally. Uh, as far as people learning parts, illiterate people maybe, repetition is everything. If they were in a theatre company and heard these plays night after night, day after day, uh, then they would pick up not only their own part, but a substantial amount of the whole play. But when, I've, when I've been in plays, I, I, at the end, I, I could remember pretty much verbatim the, the entire play, even though it wasn't my, my part. And then you forget, obviously, in the course of years. And of is, course, both it. rhythm and rhyme are immensely yeah. important in, in learning those kind of things. Absolutely. Thank you. I hope that was a useful answer. Yeah, uh, oh, Michelle's still going. I, d I just, I just some, while it flits into my mind, because it will <laughs> run off out the building in a minute, um, I'd just like to point out, I, I was really, really interested and pleased that, um, that Oliver said about the 1400 as opposed to 1375, mm. um, that, which kind of, if, if it is Treviso, and it's a big if, if, but there aren't many people like that around at this time. No, really, I mean, you've got to look up the, his back catalogue. Yeah, and what he's there aren't many people doing that sort of stuff at this time. Definitely. And what we're talking about, what's different there, is whatever oral backstory there is to it, is the boldness of actually doing a written form at that time in the vernaculars is big business. Mm -hmm. If you go to Canter if you go to Lambeth Palace in London, the Archbishop's Gaff, one of the first things you'll see is the Lollard Tower which is where the Lollards that Wycliffe is part of and that movement to translate the Bible into English and share it with ordinary people were imprisoned, okay? Now, Wycliffe, Treviso and others didn't do this lightly, okay? And if you look at Treviso's trajectory of the sort of things that he's choosing to make accessible to the public of accumulated world knowledge, mm -hmm. okay, and the way that trajectory goes... Rather like Bede on his deathbed in 735, having the temerity to translate John's gospel into his own language to share with his own people, that began a process that wasn't completed until Wycliffe and Tyndale, who were persecuted in the less tolerant late medieval and early modern world. And of course, the Cornish language Bible, we've only in the 21st century finally brought to anything like completion. And so this is, this is, this is radical dissenter social reform and political reform in a time of political meltdown. And I think Treviso's trajectory of going through the stages of the court French translations, the English vernacular translations, being on the cutting edge of that radical persecuted movement, the protest movement of its day, and then moving almost on his deathbed in his 60s, right now, from my back association with Glasney and with the oral tradition of performance in Cornwall, I'm actually going to give us Cornish plays in a literary form. And it's the literary formalisation of a long backstory process and its enshrinement in, in language, which is essentially, I think, why Travisa, for me, if it is him, and I can't see anybody else on the landscape who it's likely to be, because what he's doing in other languages is so radical that he's actually putting Cornish on the map as an European literary vernacular. Absolutely. And my, 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 my little plea there is for, as this, edu as this academic discourse goes forward, that we carry on the work that David Frost has done mm. around identifying specific clergy from Glasnay, mm. you know, like the Trollobis, etc. When did they go to Exeter College? What was what was going on there? I'm sure there's there's a lot more to be found out yeah. about that relationship yeah. and who was knocking around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do do I have uh, another question from the floor at the back, sir? Perhaps you might. Oh, is that <coughs> Mr. Oh, Baker? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to actually live in the parish of King. Wonderful, so <laughs> lovely stuff about King and and um, I live in the high school I was born, my mother's family were living in the in the 1590s. Probably a bit too late, sadly, for them to uh, actually to hear the play, because from what I learned, they would probably stop by then. But they're probably much more concerned with growing their famous key plums. I'll take orders for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you know Key, um, where the plain place is, and of course it's given its name to the little, um, or quite large village of plain place now, 
Then place, it's almost in the field. Um, it's it's some way from where the old church was. Of course, the church eventually was thought to be so remote, even in Henry VIII's time, and the petition to get it moved. And in the 19th century, it was the doctrine um, of the higher king. Um, but the turn and worry there was, was really pretty remote. There weren't any houses or buildings there, it was quite near to um, an existing Iron Age line. What it was close to, of course, was a very important um, um, route across the territory of King Harry, going down to Spike's Mount, the Pilgrim's Route, who came out of Troy, came through Caleric, then up to what is now Playing Post, down the Carmen Gate, there was no causeway ever, and then you had to head in. So um, it's just an, uh, an, uh, an observation being skewed. Her possibly it was, um, it wasn't, or, or the form that we've got doesn't doesn't suggest it may have been staged, it may have been more a library thing than a than actual um, um, stage script. Um, uh, and where it was staged, um, it is, is its importance that it was close to those main highways rather than close to, um, you, you saw, you put up that picture of the Penny Rye at St. Just and others, and also the centres of population. That's more of an observation of about Newlands K and particularly the location of, of its plenary right. I think you do have a question in there, Mr. Baker, and I'm going to uh, summarise that and I'm going to direct it to, to, to uh, Dr. Ken George because um, our, our friend uh, Meredith in Wales uh, omitted to mention that uh, Ken George actually published an edition of Newlands K before the National Library of Wales published their critical edition. Um, have you uh, any observation on why a Plenanguari, and then specifically the Plenanguari in K, why might it be in the middle of nowhere, in very commas? Well, I think Mr. Baker put his, put his finger on it. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty close to the A39, isn't it? <laughs> the A39 is, is, uh, must have been there at the time, and the other road, B, I forget the number now, the road down to King Harry okay, intersects it. I, I, I think it is a pretty good place to have a plane of worry. Oliver, do you have a...? Yes, I, I, I very much agree with what uh, Nigel Baker has said. Um, the, the other thing, to, uh, you pointed out that not only is the original church at a very inc inconvenient place, but Key Parish was actually, I think, about one of the largest parishes in Cornwall um, in the Middle Ages, because it included the whole of Kenwyn, um, which in turn included much of Truro, and so your closeness to Truro, I think, is relevant. And the church is amazingly inconveniently situated. It's <laughs> right at the end of one of the longest parishes, which stretches right up to the A30 and four boroughs. Um, so, as you say, at, at Henry VIII's time, they were allowed to move the church to a more convenient place. And sure enough, 300 years later, they did. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and the, the convenient place that they chose is actually pretty close to the playing place, isn't it? Michelle? Yeah, if I could just add, in, the, um, in West Cornwall, the, um, a lot of the plens down there and the frescoes, they're all on feeder routes into um, St Michael's Way, which I chair the Friends of St Michael's Way. And we've recently managed to get it reinstated as the only formal part of the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, which it was in the Middle Ages, so you can get your passport stamped, etc. And in the Middle Ages, there were, there were parish pilgrimages from places like Brieg and St Hilary, which had their own plens and their fresco traditions, etc. And so I think a lot of it is, as you've indicated, they're, they're feeder routes. So the places where you, you go to perform this, the same places you would go for your parish pilgrimage outings and your tea treats and, and everything back in the day. Um, and I think I mentioned also the backstory of, of liturgical drama and the vernacular interface, that there's an earlier Spanish mm -hmm. tradition from the 12th century. Mm -hmm. And I think our links as, as the feeder through the southwest. Um, basically, if you came through the southwest, you, um, you, it was so dangerous sailing across the Bay of Biscay that you didn't have to trek down through France and climb the Pyrenees because throwing your guts up on, in a ship um, for three days on the Bay of Biscay was, was worse. Okay, and so it was a big feeder route from Durham, from Ireland, etc. And so those were the feeder routes that you would really get a lot of the action and a lot of the parish 
festivities would take place in. So had we the ability to uh, roll back time a bit and get some field archaeology done before it was ploughed out of existence, I would love to go back and look at those two rounds of playing place. The older one, I surmise, is the Iron Age one, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's sub-circular. It's a bit wonky, but what you are is at the brow of a hill, you're looking at command in all kinds of places. Remember, there were lots of rains in lots of places, but absolutely, those two routes, the one from Cabellus, what we today call King Harry Ferry, uh, and, and the A39, they, they've always been massively important, and you've got your Iron Age rain. In comes this liturgical drama, this is my version of the story, in comes this liturgical drama from Europe, we don't have the town squares in the sense that Italy has, for instance. But what we have got is these big round Iron Age places mm -hmm. where probably we've been wrestling, we may have been using from other kinds of meetings, and what's the most natural thing but to whack up your scaffolding around that circle and use it as a playing place. Hang on a minute, this one's a bit old and small and wonky, we need an upgrade. And that's what I think happened at playing place that because that was the established traditional place of doing the play, they built the, the other one, the newer one, near the place that was always used. And that's where you end up with what appears to us to be a slightly strange uh, geography. That's my version. I think that's spot on. If you think about the tradition of in the 5th, 6th century of using earlier Iron Age hill forts, um, and re, you know, reusing those. And um, archaeology that we've been doing, for example, at St. Barian shows that the circular clan, the, um, the late um, uh, circa 500 clan of Bariana, is on top of a, a courtyard village, a circular courtyard village. So some of the early monasteries and, and um, hermitages are on the site of those earlier rounds as well. So it makes absolute sense that in the Middle Ages, those that weren't already developed in those sort of ways would still be used for popular gatherings and auditoria. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Ken. We've, uh, we've hit lunchtime. Before we disappear out the door, I hope you will agree with me uh, what a cracking morning we've had with so many layers of interesting contribution to this extremely important uh, line of discourse. And please, please, let this not be the last time we ha have an event of this nature. Once again, huge thanks to Chloe and team um, and, and Crescent Kerno, and thank you to each of the three of our wonderful contributors. Thank you very much.